Hi everyone and welcome to our video series, Music of Our World. You know, from the writings of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow to the lyrics of Stevie Wonder, we're constantly berated with this idea that music is a universal language of mankind. Now, as a music educator and an ethnomusicologist, I'm challenged by the veracity of such claims. So I invite you to join me down this path today as we analyze and challenge the mythology of the old cliché that music is a universal language of mankind. Music is a world within itself With a language we all understand Music is the universal language of mankind. Now, before we can examine the falsities to this claim, we must first examine the basic truths that surround it. that music is a phenomenon of our world and everywhere we go on our planet we find groupings of people participating in some form of musical activity. Within that premise however there are substantial deviations between and amongst the various musical traditions. Take for example the music coming from Africa. Did you know that in most African languages, there's not a word for music? There is, however, events in life. A child is born. The rites of puberty. It's time to hunt. It's time to go to war. Someone gets married. The king enters the village. Someone has died. And in all of these events, the community joins together in celebration between living spirits and ancestral spirits. And in those celebrations, they dance, they chant, they sing, and they drum. I'll take the music of the West, where it's presented typically in the form of a concert. And once the concert has ended, we go back to our lives. So music has become an object for contemplation, much like the paintings on the wall of a museum. This is why, for many, music has risen to the level of art, because it can now reflect aspects of life and culture. Next, practitioners of the cliché that music is the universal language of mankind, they justify their beliefs on common musical features like melody or rhythm or instrumentation. Now, by definition, music is nothing more than the organization or the manipulation of sound in time. Within that premise, sound is bound by the laws of nature in physics. Take, for example, the octave. If we take a given length of string and we pluck it, that string will vibrate at a fundamental frequency determined by its length. Now, we will assign that frequency a number to understand the calculation of its frequency. And that frequency is calculated in vibrations per second. That number, for the sake of this example, is 440. So what that means is plucking that length of string, it vibrates at 440 vibrations per second. Now what happens if we cut that string in half? What happens to the rate of vibrations? It will actually double in speed. So from 440 rotations per second, that new length of string, which is perfectly half of the original, now vibrates at 880 hertz or 880 vibrations per second. 
that relationship between 440 and 880 is referred to as the octave. It is a mathematical constant, and it exists everywhere we go on this planet. The real distinction is how each individual cultural group chooses to divide the potential range of pitches found between the octaves. Take, for example, the West, where the tuning system is organized around 12 equal distance steps. The foundation of harmony in the West is situated within the Pythagorean ratios of 2 to 1, 3 to 2, and 4 to 3, with the perfect octave, the perfect fourth, and the perfect fifth. But through the mathematical compromise of equal temperament, they've devised a system of 12 equal distance steps between the octave. However, in Thailand, that same octave is divided between seven equal distance steps, and in India, they've created a system of 22 pitches between the octave. Now, these distinctions are important because they're the foundation of our ethnocentrisms and our judgment that certain traditions are in tune and other traditions are out of tune. Three, that's a magic number. Three. It is, it's the magic number. So we begin our challenge of the cliché, music is a universal language, by employing some basic mathematic principles. We've done word problems throughout our schooling, and we know that in a word problem, the word is means equals. So in the statement, music is a universal language, what it really says is that music equals a universal language. In math, the equal sign is placed between two statements that have the same value. Thus, 2 plus 2 equals 4, and conversely, if we flip the equation around, 4 equals 2 plus 2. Now, with the cliché that music is a universal language, it raises the question, does music equal a universal language? Possibly, that's what we're here to explore. But on the flip side, if we flip the equation around, does universal language really equal music? So let's simplify the math equation. Let's remove the adjective universal from the phrase, and now let's see if the math is true. Music is language. Music equals language. And conversely, language equals music we're still left with a statement that is deeply problematic. For, unlike language, music does not convey meaning through standardized symbols, like words, nor does it follow standardized patterns akin to syntax, and it's not governed by rules of organization like grammar. Believers of the cliché that music is a universal language of mankind will often cite examples from classical music, such as Gregorian chants like the Dies Irae or Richard Wagner's leitmotifs, as evidence of music's ability to convey meaning. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with these musical devices, I led you into this clip by playing an excerpt from John Williams' Imperial March. This music is used throughout the Star Wars franchise to allude to Darth Vader or the Empire as a whole. To better understand how this works, let's turn our focus to semiology. Derived from linguistics, semiology or semiotics is the study of signs and sign systems. Now in short, a sign is any object that can convey meaning. Through the study of semiotics, we learn that all signs are broken down into three parts. We have the first part, which is the signifier. The signifier is the object itself. Next is what's referred to as 
the signified. The signified is what's being represented through the object or through the signifier. Lastly, we have the interpretant. The interpretant is any device that functions as a translator between the signified and the signifier. Really, in human life, any aspect can be reduced to a sign. And music is just one of those aspects. To best understand the semiotics of music, we must first examine the various levels of signs and their respective capacity to convey meaning as either an icon, an index, or a symbol. Now to begin, an icon is any signifier that fully resembles what it is trying to signify. The best example of this is the trash can icon on your computer screen. This icon is used to designate the proper location by which you discard any materials that you no longer need on your computer. Next is the index. An index is a signifier that partially resembles or provides enough evidence alluding to what is being signified. The best example here is smoke. They say where there is smoke, there is fire. Lastly, the symbol is any signifier that bears no resemblance to what it is trying to signify. The best example I can think of is really any letter from our alphabet. Take the letter A, for example. The written letter A is a symbol for the sound, as it bears no relationship to the sound A or A. Ah. So with each of these levels, the icon, the index, and the symbol in mind, how do we relate this to the study of music or music semiotics? Well, I transitioned us into this section of the video with the music of Brazil and the sound of the samba. Brazilian sambas at one level can function as a symbol for Brazilian national identity. But, at another level, samba music in Brazil can be an index to the time of February and the traditional carnival celebrations. And the images of the Escolas de Sambas, the samba schools, as they parade through the streets of Rio in competition. In the picture of that samba school, you see that unique drum. The Brazilian drum, the cuica, organologically is a friction drum where there's a stick that is inserted into the membrane of the drum and when rubbed creates friction which allows the membrane to vibrate. The membrane is further manipulated with the separate hand to lengthen and shorten to vary the pitch. The cuica can create melodic sounds, but also functions in a rhythmic context. In Brazil, the cuica is synonymous with one musical tradition, the samba. Now, with semiotics as our guide, we can delve into the multiplicity of signs and their meanings. See, at one level, the sound of the cuica is an index for the samba. The samba, then, becomes an index for carnival, and the entire package of the samba and its ritual functions as a symbol for the national identity of Brazil. So you can see how the multiplicity of signs and their meaning challenges the notion of universal in the cliché. Another challenge to the cliché are the anthropological perspectives of Emic, 
versus Etic. <laughs> When we study culture or cultural groups, two perspectives naturally arise. First, the emic, which is the viewpoint from the lens of the subject, coupled with the etic, or the viewpoint of the observer. Now, I combined those perspectives with what I refer to as the micro versus the macro. At a micro level, we also take into consideration the individual's experience and we couple that with the macro level, which is the collective memory or the collective cultural conditioning or enculturation. Now, when we combine all those perspectives, we apply them to a great musical exercise, and that is the national anthem. Now, as an American, my national anthem is the Star Spangled Banner. Now, if you share your experience with me, as an American, what emotion arises when you hear the Star Spangled Banner? Is it a sense of patriotism? Now, when you hear another national anthem outside of the United States, do you have the same emotion when it comes to that other national anthem? Realize that semiologically, they're both representing, they both function as a symbol representing the identity of the respective countries. But from an insider-outsider perspective, we have different emotional responses to the respective national anthems. As an American, I can really only think of one outside national anthem that perhaps creates a shared emotional experience next to the Star Spangled Banner, and that is the Russian national anthem. Every year on the 4th of July, across the United States, Americans celebrate their country's independence by igniting fireworks to the glorious sounds of the Russian national anthem as embedded into the 1812 overture by Tchaikovsky. Now, what we have here is a glorious example of the collective cultural reinterpretation of a sign in which new meaning is attached to an old object by a collective group of outsiders. As you can see by all this evidence I've provided, music is incapable of functioning as a universal language for all mankind. In fact, I find that the cliché is a statement distorted by the real truth that music as a behavior is practiced universally between and amongst all the people and cultural groups across our planet. And moreover, when we view music as a sign, we see that music is capable of conveying meanings beyond the sounds themselves. However, upon further examination into the multiplicity of signs and their function, were further challenged by any universal claims embedded within the cliché. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've certainly enjoyed putting this video together for you, and it will be one of a series of videos in which I continue to discuss topics of music semiotics, the perspectives of emic versus etic, assimilation and cultural reinterpretation, and the anthropological process of continuity and change. So join us for our future videos. Until then, thanks for watching.